and get in the mess of life. That's what God calls his people to do. To walk in each other's messes and, and somehow look to Christ and find his encouragement. God wants us to live the encouraged life. And if there's anything that breaks that off, it's a bitter heart. A critical spirit. It's when we can't forgive. And so one of the things in the passage in Luke 17, verses 1 to 10, that Jesus elevates in the relationships he wants for people is forgiveness. He wants us to talk honestly about where we fall off the path or stray away from what God's called us to. He wants us to be open to hearing people offer loving correction in our lives. He wants us to be humble enough to repent when the conviction comes. But the thing that seals the deal, that keeps the people of God and relationships together, is forgiveness. It's forgiving. And I have found that many people struggle with forgiveness. As a matter of fact, probably all of us can say we struggle with forgiveness. And so what is forgiveness? How do I do it? What is it about? I'm not going to take a, a, a lot of time here this morning because I want us to move to the next passage in Luke. But I want to highlight something that I've highlighted before and I'm going to ask you to take one on your way out. On the table in the back, right here in our auditorium, there's probably one of the best definitions descriptions of forgiveness and how to live in it that I've ever read. It's simple but profound. And it is from Charles Stanley. And I've got a sheet back there entitled 13 Steps. Now, oh boy, here we go. Well, listen, it's just trying to break down in small enough chunks that we might be able to walk in it. 13 is not some divine number and Charles Stanley is not trying to load you up with a bunch of rules. Well, what he's trying to say, that there are 13 steps that he's learned in his life that are small enough that if he could just take each step, he could live a life of forgiveness. And so this is from his book, The Gift of Forgiveness. And I'd like you to grab one of those on the way out. Now, I only made about 50 copies, so uh, if you came together as a family, you might take one and leave some for others, and then you can make a copy of it on your own. But he walks through some very practical steps on how to choose to forgive, how not to wait until you feel like forgiving. Choose to forgive. How do I do that? How do I, as an act of my will, on the authority of Christ, in the power of Jesus, walk forward and actually forgive and release the bitterness and the prison I may be in? I can't tell you how important that is. Now, if you take that, or if you don't, but if you live a life of forgiveness, you are such above the, the mess of most of life because many of our problems come from unforgiveness. It can do things physical to us. It can raise our blood pressure. It can cause heart disease. It's amazing what science has found in this area of unforgiveness. And so whether you take the sheet or not, walk in forgiveness. Now, if we do that, Jesus said, even though you live free and you're far above what most of humanity live in, you are no hero. This is expected of you. And that's what becomes very difficult because Jesus ends the first story that we looked at in Luke 17 in verse 10. And he simply says this. At the end of the day, when we do what he tells us to do and we forgive each other from the heart, he says we should just simply say we are unworthy servants and we've only done our duty. Mm. God wants you to forgive. But he wants you to see it's for all of us and not for the super saints. And it's your duty to forgive. Now when I mentioned that word duty, that has become a dirty word for many of us in our Christian subcultures. And I want to tell you why. 
And I want to tell you why is uh, part of the reason it's become a dirty word is because we're trying to move outside of some kind of ritualistic and legalistic faith that says just do some of these things on the outside and everything will be okay. Some of us grew up in churches or perhaps we went to small groups and it was all about do you smoke, do you chew, or do you go with girls who do? <laughs> and so we look at that, uh, those nasty three commandments. Are we, are, we, are we even expanded in our great godliness to the filthy five? And if you're really holy, boy, you keep a dozen rules. You keep the dirty dozen. And we live in this life of just marching to raw moral principles. No life inside. And many of us are trying to move away from that. Is that what God has for us? That life is supposed to be grinded out, just keep the rules? And so duty became a dirty word. And, and many years ago, Several years ago, John Piper burst on the scene with his book, Desiring God. And if you haven't read it, read it. Because what he talks about is that duty is not the whole picture for us. Delighting in God is. Delighting in God. Now, having said all of this, I just want to say that duty is not a dirty word. As a matter of fact, it's honorable. If you're in wartime and you're a bunch of Marines, and you're walking together, and you're fighting together, and you're, you're keeping your brothers back, and you're fighting toward a goal, and, and, and your brother gets wounded out in a minefield, duty tells you, crawl out there and get him. And you won't feel like doing it. And if you wait for the feeling, you will be a coward. So duty has its place. But I think what Jesus does and how Luke masterfully puts this mosaic of Jesus is he puts duty in its right place. It has its place. It's just not the whole thing. Because God may want us at some time to focus on, listen, be faithful even if you don't like to. But in the whole of life, he's saying, I want you to journey from duty to delight. And so today... We want to go on that journey. Duty is not bad. It's just not the whole enchilada. And God wants us to move from just a duty-ridden Christianity to a delight in the Lord. How do we do that? Well, Luke says, let me tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about the journey from duty to delight. It begins in verse 11 of Luke 17, and it goes through verse 19. Here's what he says. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he was going into a village. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God? Accept this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. That's the story from duty to delight. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for building a, a wonderful picture, a mosaic. Help us to keep duty in its proper place and not just stay there but move into delight. Would you instruct us and help us and empower us in Jesus' name? Amen. Duty. It's your duty to forgive, but I don't want you to be bound by duty. 
I want you to move into delight. It's interesting that Luke chooses a story of lepers and ten of them. I don't know that ten is any magic number, but it does cause some people to say, well, there are ten commandments, and many people live by ten rules, and they just march to these ten rules regardless of what their heart is like. And there were ten men who had leprosy. And it's in this broken world of disease and failure and uncleanness that Jesus marches in and says, there are some things I want you to do. I want you to do what I command you. That is your duty. Do that. But I want to tell you, in the brokenness of life, you can come to me. It's interesting in the Old Testament that if you had leprosy, you had to stay at a distance and you had to live out of town. Jesus is on this border between Samaria, where the half-breeds lived, half Jew, half Gentile, and Galilee, which was the land of all Gentiles, if you will. There were Jews there, but it was the land of the Gentiles. And so he's on this border between foreigners and half-breeds, and he's just outside the village as he's coming in, and there is a community of people who only get together because of their disease. They are commanded that they cannot live with their families. They cannot live in town. And so they're outside of town, restricted in some kind of slum, living in dirt and filth. And they are supposed to cry out from a distance, according to the law in Leviticus. They're supposed to say, unclean. And the reason they say that is so that you will stay away. But it was something about Jesus that they cried out, come near. We need you. In the story of moving from just duty-filled faith into delightful faith, we see a story of brokenness, of sin, and of uncleanness. The unclean cannot cleanse themselves. The sick cannot make themselves well. There is nothing they can do to change their circumstances or their lives. They can't earn God's blessing. And there's only one thing they can do. Cry out to Jesus. So I'd like to suggest to you that while duty is important, here's something we have to give up in order to enter into delight. We have to give up the performance syndrome. That God will only bless me if I get everything right. While he tells us there are things that I do want you to do, and I want you to keep these in mind, he also tells us, you can't do that perfectly, and you can't do everything in the law perfectly. And so what are you going to do with yourself when duty demands some kind of response, and yet at the same time, delight takes us into our own sin? In order to Delight in Jesus, we have to see ourselves like those lepers. Now, leprosy in the Bible uh, was probably a catch-all term for all kinds of skin diseases. But true leprosy is a hardening of the feelings. It's something that wears down those nerve endings so that you abuse yourself and beat yourself up. Physical leprosy inflicts a few, but spiritual leprosy affects us all. John Piper, again, in his book, Desiring God, said this, Sin is like spiritual leprosy. It deadens your spiritual senses so that you rip your soul to shreds and you don't even feel it. This is what happens when we live in uncleanness. Over a period of time, there's a hardening of heart. We no longer know right from wrong, and we no longer care. If you are aware of your need today for Jesus to come and touch you with cleanness and to bring a forgiveness and a freshness into your life, praise the Lord because you understand your true reality. If you don't feel anything and you're just kind of deadened in your own heart, the spiritual leprosy has taken over, and the only thing you can think is rational, it must be that I've got some great need, then recognize that need. And whether you feel it or you don't, cry out to Jesus, because this is the path to delight. 
whether you sense your need or not, you can't work your way back to Christ's mercy. His blessing is always a matter of grace. And you will never deserve it. You can only receive it. And so I believe that one of the things that Luke tells me is that if I'm going to see Christianity as more than duty, and I would engage in delight, I have to take this performance syndrome and put it on the side and come to Jesus just as I am. Now when we do that, that's just stage one. Stage two in walking in delight means I want you to walk a different way or there's something I may have for you. Notice what Jesus does with these lepers. He says, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Can I share with you perhaps something that God has been impressing upon me? Duty is one thing, but I'm moving to delight. And one way that I move in delight is to obey Jesus. Obey Him. Faith follows. Genuine faith in Jesus follows Jesus. And so when He commands them, I'm not going to wave my hand. I'm not going to touch you like I did in Luke 5. He touched a leper. I'm going to ask you, go your way. Go show yourself to the priest. Now that had something to do with Israel in the whole thing of being the witness of their Messiah. But personally it meant you've got to do what I show you. The emphasis at this point is that the story tells us that if we will simply follow Jesus, then we can walk in power and authority and renewal. They were cleansed as they went. Reminded me of a story in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 5. Naaman went to the prophet Elisha. And he goes to him, and he too is a leper. And he goes up to the prophet, and he says, you know, I've got these sores, and I, and I, and I, I need healing. And guess what Elisha told him? Very same thing Jesus did. Go. He didn't wave his hand, pray over him, touch him, call on God to heal. He said, go, wash yourself in the Jordan seven times and you will be healed. Guess how Naaman responded to that. He was hopping mad. He was mad, the scripture tells us. It says that Naaman went away angry. He's stomping away. You didn't heal me just as I came before you? And there's what he said as he walked away mad. I thought that Elisha would, heal, would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me from leprosy. Aren't there better rivers in Damascus in the land that I came from than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And so it says he walked off in a rage. But Naaman... Being a nobleman, had his attendants around him, and they ran after him. Hey, Naaman, wait a minute. Don't be mad. Just obey. And Naaman goes to the River Jordan. He dips in seven times, following in obedience. And he comes back, and it says that his skin, that once had blisters and oozing sores, now was like a youthful skin over him. He was healed. Naaman came back to Elisha and he stood before him and he says, listen, now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. When Jesus told the man to go, the ten to go, he was telling them a very important principle. We can be angry when things don't happen quickly. But are we willing to follow Christ's plan for us and realize that our complete healing is a matter of complete surrender. And God wants us to follow Him. Follow Jesus. Faith follows. Period. And so as they went off, they were healed, and they came back. The one of them came back, praising God in a loud voice, and he throws himself at Jesus' feet. And here is the real point. Uh, stage one, we cry out to Jesus. Stage two, we do what he tells us. But let's get to stage three because it's the most wonderful part of living in delight. 
And here's stage three. It's when we overflow with praise and thankfulness. When we overflow with praise and thankfulness, this man came back and he began praising God and he fell at Jesus' feet. And Jesus said, where are the rest of them? Just you came back? But he was a man who couldn't help but come back because he praised God. This is the formula for living and growing in the Christian life. Let me tell you, Colossians 2.6, Paul says, here's the way you grow in Christ. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue in him. How did you receive him? By faith. Now listen, receive and walk in faith, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith you were taught, and then he says this, and overflowing with thankfulness. Thanksgiving, praise, is a part of walking in delight. I have to tell you that I haven't always walked in that. And even recently, I found it a challenge. I got up and it seemed like every day something was the wrong, the, it, the circumstances weren't right. I was down, I was fighting this thing. And then God led me to Psalm 13. Psalm 13. He was trying to teach me about praise and thanksgiving. I put it in your bulletin because I believe this is key in walking in praise and thanksgiving. Would you look at it? You know, when I walk in praise and thanksgiving, just as uh, anyone else in Scripture, I need to do so even despite my circumstances. Look at this. How long, Lord, this is David praying this, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Have you ever asked anything like that? Man, life stinks. I could use a better word than that, but I'll save it. Life stinks. We say four times. How long? How long? How long? How long, O oh Lord? In the midst of difficult times. We cry out in authenticity. But if you keep looking at this wonderful psalm, he asks a prayer, look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. In other words, if you don't come near me, I'm just flat going to die. And my enemy will say I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice all. Oh that I have fallen. But the psalm shifts with praise. And these things I want to leave with us today about walking in praise. But I trust in your unfailing love. Now notice nothing had changed yet. Nothing had changed. He's asked questions, cried out to God. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Why does God want us to praise him? I want to tell you why. C.S. Lewis, and many of you have probably read some of his works, in his reflection on the Psalms tells us why praise is most important. Listen to his words. We delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. Listen, when you go to a movie and you really like that movie, the first thing you do is either call someone or you come home and you go, man, you got to see that movie. That was awesome. And it's almost like the enjoyment of the movie isn't complete until you voice that to somebody. You know, if you go to your favorite restaurant and just sit there all alone and enjoy the food and you never tell anybody, you probably really don't enjoy it. But when you walk away from that great pile of jalapeno peppers in, a, in that Mexican food, and you go, wow, that was great. I want you to come with me. I want you to enjoy it with me. You see, praise completes the enjoyment. And what has God called us to do? 
but to enjoy him forever. What is the chief end of man? But to glorify God and enjoy him forever. God invites us to enjoy him. And the way we enjoy him is by praising him. Let me tell you what happened to me that day that I started looking at Psalm 13. I read this psalm and I said, oh yeah, man, it expresses how my heart feels. It expresses what my mind thinks. It is expressing my current thing. Oh, I don't like what this is going on, God. But then I got to those two verses at the end and I said, I got to sing to God. And Ted has talked about this before. And Ted has been an inspiration for me. Listen, I started singing to God. I go, well, okay, I'll sing a song. And I thought of a hymn that I remembered as a little boy about praising God. And I just started singing that. And then God said, how about singing a new song? And I just started letting it rip. I, I, I'm just singing. You know, when Ted sometimes says, sing a new song, what he's trying to get us to do is to praise God so that we might enjoy him and all of his wonder. You see, God inhabits the praise of his people, and he's calling us to praise, and that's how we move from duty to delight. That's the big part. Searchers have proven that what most parents probably have all known instinctively, but there's actually scientific proof right now, and that is gratitude doesn't come naturally. If you're a parent, you kind of got that when you had your first kid. Gratitude does not come naturally. In her book entitled The Gift of, 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 of Thanks, Margaret Visser cites a study on how parents teach their, par their kids to say a few essential things. Hi, thanks, and goodbye. Those are things that we all teach our children. The children in the study spontaneously said hi 27% of the time. That meant about 70-something percent they didn't. But 27% they did. Now, now, when someone was leaving, they would say goodbye 25% of the time. But when it came to giving thanks or saying thanks to someone, they only did it 7% of the time. Now, these are scientific studies. I don't know who calculates this stuff. I think I'd be looking for a padded room if I was... Okay, how many was that? But they actually counted. Parents had to prompt their kids to say hi 28% of the time, goodbye 33% of the time, but they had to prompt them to say thanks 51% of the time. What does that tell us? Thanks is not natural. In conclusion, Visser writes, children had a much more difficult time learning to say thanks than almost anything else. Most children have to learn to say thank you even before they know what it means. It's interesting. Visser writes, eventually when children have matured and have been further educated, they will then be able to feel the emotion that the words express. The words come first, the feelings later. That's what Visser writes. This isn't Bible. This is a woman looking at scientific studies. But it teaches us, give thanks before the feeling. The feelings come later. Visser also notes that although we have to grow into the practice of thanksgiving, uh, thanksgiving, once we finally learn to be grateful, we seldom forget it. That's fascinating. It becomes a part of our DNA. Studies have even shown that people suffering from Alzheimer's disease actually said thank you. It's one of the last things they forget. If we simply put our faith into action, walking on the path of delight, we will say thank you even when we don't feel it and the feelings will come later. Other research has seen, uh, even the November article in the Wall Street Journal, which I love to read almost daily, recorded that adults who frequently feel grateful, listen to this, they have more energy, more optimism, most, more social connections, and more happiness than those who don't. 
According to studies conducted in the past decade, they are less likely to be depressed, envious, greedy, or alcoholics. They earn more money, sleep more soundly, exercise more regularly, and have greater resistance to viral infection. All right. Again, all just being grateful. In our modern day, researchers are finding out that gratitude brings similar benefits in children and adolescents. It says that when children act in grateful ways, they tend to be, listen to this, less materialistic, get better grades, set higher goal, goals, complain of fewer headaches and stomach aches, feel more satisfied with their friends, family, and schools than those who don't. If your kid is a complainer, teach them to say thank you. So what is the psalm teaching us? Lord, how long am I going to suffer this way? Look on me. Help me. But while I'm in the process, I have two words for you. Thank you. Two more I'm going to add to it. Praise you. You see, praise and thanksgiving is God's remedy for us in a broken world. That we would move from duty and live in the delight of the Lord. Sometimes we have to be thankful for some irritations in our lives and God does not let them up. Why? Because he's going after something or he's protecting you. In her book, The Hiding Place, a very familiar story, and I've even used it before, but Corey Ten Boom tells about the incident that taught her the principle of giving thanks in all things. It was during World War II and Corey and her sister Betsy were in a, in a concentration camp for keeping Jewish people in their home. They were arrested in, in prison in Ravensbrook. The barracks were extremely crowded, and guess what? They were infested with fleas. One morning, they read in their tattered Bible from 1 Thessalonians the reminder to rejoice in all things. Betsy, the one who died in the court concentration camp, Corey actually lived and was set free. But Betsy said to her sister, Corey, we've got to give thanks for this barracks and even for these fleas. No way. No way. Corey said, no way. Am I going to give thanks to God for fleas? But Betsy was persuasive and they did thank God even for the fleas. Now during the months that followed, they found that their barracks were relatively free. They could do Bible studies and pray, and the, and the guards wouldn't come around. They found out that their barracks was a place of refuge because several of the guards never entered those barracks because they hated the fleas. You see, sometimes God's got an irritating person like a flea in front of you at work. Some of you are married to a flea. Some of you are the flea. <laughs> and God says, give thanks. Give thanks. Because he's doing something bigger and better than you could ever imagine. Now that doesn't mean resign yourself to live in sick and unhealthy ways. It doesn't mean that if you're physically infirm, don't ask somebody to pray for you. That isn't what this is saying. This isn't saying that we just reluctantly accept everything that comes along without ever standing up and saying to God in Jesus' name. But what it does mean is that we're taking in the brokenness of our life and we're moving in to praising God. We're moving in to a delight in the Lord that is not tied to circumstances. We delight in Him. That morning as I sat in my darkened house everyone else asleep, I had to rest restrain my voice from waking up the whole family because the praise started coming and my circumstances didn't change, but I did. I was different. Would you show the couple of pictures? Just leave it here a minute. I shared with you when I came back from India that one of the highlights of my trip was getting near and touching lepers. This man has no fingers on either hand, no toes on either feet. 
And he eats in the typical way in India. But he only has a palm in which to scrape the rice up and eat it. What would it be like to be one of those lepers? Like in Bible times, they live together. Their fellowship is among the diseased. They're not accepted in towns. And they live in their own colonies. One of the reasons I'm so thankful to Bishop Jacob and so proud and honored to join with him in India is he goes to the outcast and he brings the love of Jesus. Show the next one. It's not only their hands but their feet. A common sore among the lepers is on the bottom of their feet. It's like the disease just oozes out knocking them off their feet where they can't stand. But again, Bishop Jacob working with a medical team, ministering, praying over, asking God for healing, and then doing everything that medical science says would help, applying cream to the oozing sores. These people are not unlike the people of Jesus' day. But as we stood before them, Bishop Jacob said, Pastor Randy, come and say a few words. And I looked at their faces. I said, what do I say? <laughs> Middle class America? I, I've got health and money and life. And Jesus told me just one thing. Love them the way I do. Love them the way I do. I found in a people in a leper colony raising hands without fingers to the Lord. And even they said, thank you. So as I went to minister to them, they actually did to me. They taught me in the midst of their sores and their difficulties. It's always good to praise the Lord. I had to go all the way to India to get this lesson. And I pray each of us walk away with it today. Let's just close our eyes and bow our heads for a moment. One of our elders, Jerry Cobal, has said that the elders want to be down in front because uh, we don't believe God wants us just to take disease and say, well, it's just your lot in life. We want to pray for healing. And we want to trust God in whatever He wants to do. But we're going to ask Him for big and mighty things. But we're also going to ask people to be filled with the Spirit. To walk in newness of life. Even to walk in a life of praise. So some of the elders will be in the front. But I want you, with your head bowed, to just kind of put your right hand just down in front of you with the palm up. You've got five fingers there. They're all healthy. And I just want you, just for a moment, to exercise the greatest gift of delight, saying thank you. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. And then you might look at your, four, your five fingers, and you might say, I'm just going to thank God right now I'm just going to walk in this even if I don't feel it. But I'm going to thank God for five things or five people or five somethings. I don't want us to leave here saying, well, that was a nice message. I want us to live it. Because God's taking us from duty to delight. And he does it in praise and thanksgiving.